afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum. I'm Tom Schwartz, the director, and we're delighted to have with us Hank Meyer, author of the biography Arthur Vandenberg, The Man in the Middle of the American Century. Uh, if you haven't yet viewed our temporary exhibit, Tall Grass to Knee High, A Century of Iowa Farming, I hope you'll do so after the talk and the book signings. The exhibit, like all temporary exhibits, education programs and public programs such as this talk, are made possible with support from the Hoover Presidential Foundation. Our speaker today is a distinguished businessman as well as author and historian. Hank Meyer, when he's not dealing with corporate matters for the family business, Meyer Supermarket Chain, pursues his passion for history. His close personal friendship with the late President and Mrs. Gerald R. Ford led him to serve as Vice President and a trustee of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. Meyer wrote a biography of his grandfather, who started the family supermarket business, and always remained interested in history. He also had an interest in Vandenberg, but knew that a prof history professor was busy at work on the topic, so it simply remained Hank's interest. When that history professor died, his daughter did not want her father's work to go to the local garbage dump. She contacted the Historical Society of Michigan inquiring if anyone would be interested in receiving her father's research files on Vandenberg. Hank Meyer was contacted and agreed to accept the materials. From 1989 until 2017, he worked on the Vandenberg biography, fitting it into the small amounts of free time from the demands of running a major corporation. The result is the book you will hear discussed today. Arthur Vandenberg is not a household name, any more than Herbert Hoover is. But Vandenberg exerted a significant influence in what became the bipartisan Cold War consensus that characterized American foreign policy from Truman through Reagan. Here today to provide more insight into the man and his legacy, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Hank Barr. Thank you, Tom, and, and welcome and thank you for braving the cold and rain to join us today. It's a pleasure also to be back in West Branch. I was here about, oh gosh, about 20 years ago and, and enjoying the exhibits and, and learning from this facility and, and to come back through Iowa City where actually in the early stages of working on this book, I, I was, um, took a biography course in the Summer Writers Workshop. So Iowa has, has played a part in this project. And I was thinking that this fall actually marks the 90th anniversary of the election of two statesmen whose careers influenced the course of the nation, President Herbert Hoover and Senator Arthur Vandenberg. Their stories intertwine, but here in the hometown of one with whom you are all familiar, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about the other, and whose role in shaping what we think of as the modern post-war world has been largely forgotten. Back in 1990, when I started researching this book, if you walk down the street in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and ask someone, who's Arthur Vandenberg? The answer you were likely to get from most people was, was he related to the jewelry store? Because there was one by that name. The answer is no, but that was the, that was the state into which his legacy had fallen. And it's funny how history conspires to, to elevate some legacies and to obscure others. You could say that happened to Arthur Vandenberg. As we start today with a more familiar figure, our 38th president. Arthur Vandenberg was becoming a world figure in 1946 when he met a young lawyer just out of the Navy. The distinguished senator, with his comb-over haircut and puffed-up ego, was back in town only briefly, stopping by his office at a local hotel. And he'd just come from a post-war peace conference in Paris and Jerry Ford was just hanging out his shingle with a local law firm. But Jerry was also the fresh face of what they called the Home Front Movement, which included his father, that was challenging the corrupt Republican political machine that controlled state government. And two years later, in 1948, 
Vandenberg was fuming over the refusal of his own hometown congressman to support his efforts to win approval of the Marshall Plan and other important legislation after World War II. Vandenberg was happy to see a challenge to the Republican incumbent, and he let it be known that he was backing Jerry Ford. But our story today starts much earlier, at the beginning of the 20th century, when a teenager just out of high school fell under the sway of the most exciting politician of that era, Theodore Roosevelt. Arthur Vandenberg was born in 1884, the son of a harness maker who nearly went broke when Arthur was nine years old. Trying to help support the household, the young Arthur launched, launched himself as an entrepreneur. He set up a delivery business with other boys, pushing carts of shoes from a factory to the railroad station. And he was something of a prodigy in government studies. Now he claimed he'd been reading the congressional record since he was 14. I have no evidence to back that up, but no reason to doubt it. His, his first job after graduating was working at a biscuit factory downtown, and he was fired the day he left his desk to join a campaign parade for the charismatic young governor of New York, Teddy Roosevelt, who had come to town in the fall of 1900 as a candidate for vice president on the ticket with William McKinley. Uh, to think that young Vandenberg was both fired and inspired <laughs> because he soon went, walked up the street looking for another job and found one as a reporter for the Grand Rapids Herald, where he quickly became their most prolific stringer at the time. Today we hear stringer as a part-time newspaper employee. At that time it was whoever had the longest string of copy that they would paste on the wall. And he covered the police beat and city hall and his first byline at the age of 16, a few weeks later, came was a full-page story on the Electoral College. He was a regular Republican when the city and the state and really much of the country outside the South were all mostly Republican. He was not yet 22 when the longtime editor died and the paper's owner, Republican Senator William Alden Smith, chiefly famous for having conducted the hearings into the sinking of the Titanic, by the way, tapped him to be editor. And he married his high school sweetheart, a West Side girl born in, on the west side of Grand Rapids. Uh, but in 1917, at the age of 33, she died, leaving him as a single parent with three small children. Soon after, he reconnected with a woman he'd met during his brief stint at the University of Michigan. Hazel Vandenberg was writing advertising copy for a department store in Detroit when their courtship began and later that year they were married. After World War I, Vandenberg fought for reservations to Senate approval of American membership in the new League of Nations. But he tried to find a compromise between supporters of President Woodrow Wilson, who refused to make any changes to the League covenant that he'd negotiated at Versailles, and his opponents, led by the Republican chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Henry Cabot Lodge. Vandenberg sent Lodge his editorials and in reply to one, Lodge wrote back, I'm going to steal your line. Unshared idealism is a menace. And Vandenberg also wrote speeches for presidential candidate Warren Harding, and then three books inspired by his hero, Alexander Hamilton. None of which, of course, were optioned for theatrical or motion picture production. <laughs> it was a little ahead of his time. But uh, the subtitle also talks about something he would never back away from, and it's hard to read from there. But it's the trail of a tradition, and he's talking about Hamilton and Hamilton's farewell address that he wrote for George Washington, talking about how the United States must be neutral and avoid entangling alliances with those pesky Europeans. And he talks about nationalism, not internationalism, is the indispensable bulwark of American independence. And from his second floor office in the new Herald Building, overlooking the Veterans Park in Grand Rapids, the editor and publisher was making a name for himself on the national stage. He was also preparing to chase his dream and run for the United States Senate in 1928 when the incumbent died and he was appointed to the seat. So expectations were high when Arthur and Hazel arrived in Washington just in time for the White House Easter egg hunt hosted by Calvin Coolidge, and he was eager to work with the new president elected that fall in 1928. Herbert Hoover. President Hoover's brand of what might be called modern conservatism appealed to the freshman senator. In fact, he saw 
who, I think he saw a reflection of himself in Hoover to some degree, the, the self-made kid from the Midwest who comes to the Senate with conservative principles and yet reform-minded ideas. And I think that really worked well, that, that resonated with Vandenberg, who saw himself as a broker between the GOP's major factions, the largely East Coast old guard and the mostly Western band of progressives. And this fractious mix was a particular challenge to the new president, Hoover, who had never held elective office. And though Hoover was a brilliant engineer and administrator, he struggled to corral the Republican majority, struggled to communicate with the progressive leader, William Bora of Idaho, who quickly became a mentor for Vandenberg. So Hoover lacked finesse, to say the least, in working with Congress. And then, of course, the stock market crashed in 1929 and doomed his presidency. Um, Vandenberg saw a role for himself as a broker between those GOP factions and then as a go-between between, between Hoover and Bora, trying to get them to work together and largely without success. But that was the role he saw for himself. And he, he gained a reputation as, as one of the one of the old guard called him the Young Turk, trying to find that role. And the next he tries to work with Franklin Roosevelt after Roosevelt's landslide victory in 1932. And he's a savvy politician in a state that's no longer reliably Republican, and he's also ready at a time of national emergency to cooperate with the Democratic administration. So he supports some of the early New Deal remedies for a crippled economy. And he has one of his own, savings deposit insurance, to protect small depositors and save the nation's banks. This was an outgrowth of uh, Detroit was the head had the first serious banking crisis. There were a couple of holding companies that were on the verge of collapse and approached the Hoover administration, Secretary of the Treasury Mellon, hoping for a government bailout. And Hoover had created the Re Reconstruction Finance Corporation to, to come to the assistance of banks, but these banks didn't have enough collateral. And so there's a huge argument there and Hoover pleading with um, through, through his intermediaries with Henry Ford, who controlled one of those banks, to put more collateral in. And Ford, in a standoff with, Van, with Vandenberg's other Michigan senator, James Cousins, who had once been Ford's chief operating officer, had grown very wealthy with Ford Motor Company, and then split with Ford, and they were bitter enemies. And Ford, like, Ford won't do anything until Cousins put more, puts more money in. Cousins <laughs> won't do anything until Ford puts more money in. First banking crisis, the country's on the verge of collapse, and, the, and, and Hoover and Vandenberg are frantically working to get them together. Um, the, ultimately, they got Ford to put in a little money and were able to do that. But um, Hoover had fought Vandenberg's proposal for, the, for deposit insurance, and then Roosevelt does too, both of them in different ways. <laughs> Uh, I think through their secretaries of the treasury were reflecting a Wall Street view that if you insure bank deposits, you might be propping up weak banks at the expense of the strong. But Vandenberg had the votes in the Senate. It really was a populist measure and a new law to create the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Now Roosevelt came to see the value of that and, and much to Vandenberg's chagrin, was all too happy to claim credit for what <laughs> might have been the most successful of all New Deal legislation. But it was the brainchild of Arthur Vandenberg. So as, as the reach of federal power grew, though, Vandenberg tried to draw a good Republican distinction between being social-minded and socialistic. And he broke with Roosevelt over executive rulemaking that he regarded as too intrusive. He was a vigilante when he thought the New Deal was overstepping the Constitution and he certainly couldn't abide Roosevelt's attempt to tinker with the Supreme Court because it had rejected some of his legislation. This hardening of Vandenberg's opposition to FDR was coinciding with world events that posed new dangers. The rise of Hitler in Germany and Mussolini in Italy threatened peace in Europe. The Japanese war cabinet ordered an invasion of China. And in the face of threats around the globe, Vandenberg fell back on what was for him a first principle. He recalled Washington's farewell address, written by his hero Hamilton, warning the young republic to avoid taking sides when the European powers collide. 
Let there be no entangling alliances, Washington warned. And to Vandenberg, that meant one thing in the 1930s, American neutrality. And so as war clouds gathered in Europe, he preached neutrality. And he did it everywhere, again and again. Here he did it at a, at a fair in Michigan where he's <laughs> uh, surrounded by good Republican elephants. And, and he led the Senate isolationists who stymied Roosevelt's attempts to aid the European democracies. In fact, if you've seen that um, new Churchill movie, Darkest Hour, and there's a there's a scene which, of course, didn't happen, where where Churchill's on the phone with Roosevelt, begging for the release of weapons that the British have ordered. Uh, it would have been Vandenberg who was leading the fight to prevent that. In September 1939, however. Debates about neutrality took on new urgency when German bombers filled the skies over Warsaw and German tanks rolled into Poland. Over a national radio hookup from a baseball field in Grand Rapids, Vandenberg declared, this is not our war. And before it became our war, with the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, he led the band of isolationists, mostly Republicans, but Democrats too, who fought Roosevelt every step of the way. They distrusted FDR's every move, fearing that American boys would be pulled into combat in another distant war. The isolationists fought and lost a fight to keep the arms embargo in the 1937 Neutrality Act that Vandenberg had helped create. They fought and lost a fight over the Lend-Lease deal, giving destroyers to the British Navy. Roosevelt was their nemesis, and Arthur Vandenberg was their organizing spirit. The in 1936, Vandenberg had avoided Kansas Governor Alf Landon's attempt to dra draft him as his vice presidential running mate, which was a smart move. FDR carried every state except Maine and Vermont. But in the run up to 1940, Vandenberg was viewed as a leading candidate for the Republican nomination. In fact, in 1938, the FBI opened an office in Grand Rapids. When the agent was sent there and was asked about his new and someone asked him about his new assignment, he said he'd been there, he was there to keep an eye on Arthur Vandenberg. And it's a little bit, I mean, Grand Rapids is a lot like Des Moines and in hardly a hotbed of organized crime. <laughs> and in nineteen thirty-eight, you know, the federal budget was still rather strained. And it was interesting. I I, I had had one very elderly a uh, newspaper man in Grand Rapids who'd, who'd shared this story with me, and I thought, you know, I'm putting it in the book, but I don't have it corroborated. And then I was talking just a few months ago, at, way, way after the book came out, with an FBI agent who'd retired from the office in Grand Rapids, and he was explaining the structure of the FBI, and he said, well, um, you know, there are 56 divisional offices, they call them, around the country in all the major metro areas, so Milwaukee, Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis, Kansas City are all going to have and all going to have these divisional offices that report into Washington, and then there are smaller district offices that report in through those divisional offices. So Grand Rapids typically would report in through Chicago or Detroit, and he said, and, and, which it does today. And he said, you know, my colleagues and I could never figure out why, when that office was set up, it reported directly into Washington, meaning directly into J. Edgar Hoover. So I, I take that as collaboration. <laughs> and for those of us who think that the F, you know, who like to think the FBI was never political, um, we know that. Um, but the um, in nineteen, but Vandenberg and his isolationist colleague Robert Taft, Vandenberg on the right, Taft on the left were swept aside in 1940, along with their traditional isolationist point of view, by the charismatic lawyer, Wendell Wilkie, whose willingness to intervene in Europe nearly matched Roosevelt. Pearl Harbor made Vandenberg's isolationism look obsolete, and America was soon all in, in a global war. As the war began to turn in favor of the Allies, who were dubbed by FDR the United Nations, Roosevelt faced two big, excuse me, Republicans faced two big questions. One was partisan. Wendell Wilkie was what today might be called a rhino. He had been a Democrat before he ran for the Republican nomination. He was regarded by most of the GOP establishment as an opportunistic interloper. Any comparison to the present day will get a little bit confusing. And his nomination <laughs> reflected a deep schism in the party, one that's still with us today between isolationists or unilateralists on the one hand and internationalists or those who believe in broader global cooperation on the other. 
if Republicans were going to have a chance at the presidency in 1944, now they've been out of power for a dozen years, these factions needed to come together. But how? And the other question on the minds of Americans in 1943 of all political was on the minds of all Americans of all political stripes. What would the world look like after the war, and what role should the United States play in it? Would the U.S. retreat again as we did after World War I? And then Vandenberg's editorials had faulted Wilson and the League of Nations. Now the question was whether and how nations might organize themselves to avoid future catastrophe. And Roosevelt wasn't saying. Senators and congressmen had all kinds of ideas. Bills were bubbling up in congressional committees. But FDR was Dr. Win the War. When Democrats in Congress wanted to introduce resolutions in the House or Senate, he quashed them. He did not want to rock the boat or risk alienating our allies. The Soviets had designs on their neighbors. The British had an <coughs> empire to reclaim. Both might feel threatened if American, the Congress starts passing resolutions or legislation talking about independence and freedom, whether it's for Poland or for the colonials. And FDR was a one-man band on foreign policy. In fact, his State Department was often on the sidelines. When there were important missions, it was Harry Hopkins who was meeting with Stalin or Churchill, talk about Iowa, another Iowan, not the diplomats in the State Department. So to answer that first question about the Republican platform in 1944 and Republican unity, the GOP called a meeting of its leading elected officials to be held at the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island in northern Michigan over Labor Day weekend, 1943. And if any of you ever had occasion to go to the Grand Hotel, it's, it has this long, what they, all, they always advertise in the tourist brochures as the longest porch in the world. And here's Vandenberg, uh, who was chairing the Republican the policy, foreign policy group, challenged to find common ground. Here he is with some of his colleagues in front of the hotel. And not for the first time, he looked for a middle way, just as he had in those early years with, with Hoover between the old guard and the progressives. In this case, between isolationists who wanted nothing more than to wash their hands of the world and bring the troops home after the war, many of whom were his longtime friends and allies, and the Wilkie adherents who held varying ideas about world federalism or an international police force or a revived League of Nations. Here they are in, their, in the meeting of this foreign policy group and to Vandenberg's left, to our right on the screen, is Robert, Senator Robert Taft of Ohio, who was the leading isolationist, and beyond him, Governor Earl Warren of California. They only, the Republican, the national chairman, only invited elected officials. So Wilkie actually, even though he was the, in, by title, the head of the party, he was not invited to uh, talk, to be a part of this gathering. And Republicans came out of that meeting with a statement they could run on, and an expression of support for some sort of world organization that, because of Roosevelt's I think, proper concentration on winning the war, went beyond anything Roosevelt or the Democrats had yet offered and the wonderfully ambiguous and grandly named Mackinac Charter calling for American participation in a post-war organization set the stage for things to come. When I succeeded in putting 49 prima donnas together, Vandenberg told Henry Luce of Time Magazine, and it certainly took one to know one, I discovered <laughs> the necessary formula. For Vandenberg, compromise was almost an art form. He was moving away from isolationism. Pearl Harbor played a part. So did his nephew, Hoyt Vandenberg, an Air Force general and student of modern warfare who'd been in London for the Battle of Britain and would drop by Uncle Arthur's Connecticut Avenue apartment on a Sunday afternoon to talk, strat to talk strategy in the kitchen. And Vandenberg's mistress, probably planted by British intelligence, probably had much less influence, but it's fun to talk about. <laughs> by contrast, he relished the favorable press response to the Mackinac Charter as the GOP suddenly grabbed the spotlight in advancing support for what would become the United Nations. But even as he was moving in a new direction, it was chiefly behind the scenes. Most of the public still thought of him as the voice of isolationism. And that changed on January 10th, 1945. The Allies were winning the war, closing in on Japan island by island, pushing across the Rhine into Germany, 
in a weary Roosevelt, in poorer health than anyone knew, was about to leave for the Russian resort of Yalta on the Black Sea to meet with Stalin and Churchill to talk about what to do as the collapse of the Third Reich drew near. Vandenberg was worried. Neither he nor his colleagues knew what the three leaders would be deciding or what deals FDR might commit to on our behalf. And I was thinking just recently that as we talk about the world order, the this meeting of Roosevelt in Yalta <coughs> was really the last time from President Truman through President Obama when there was a summit between the Russian and the American leaders and we really didn't know what was being talked about and what was going on or what deals might be cut. Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative from 1946 to 2016, I guess, that, that there was, a, there was nobody worried about what are they doing there until Helsinki. So in a very <laughs> different sense, Yalta and Helsinki, I mean, you know, not the issues of great world-shaking importance in Helsinki that there was in Yalta, but that was the first time since then that a big segment of the population might wonder, what's, what are they talking about? Um, and so Vandenberg's response to that in January of 1945 was to give a speech. He had to speak up, and on January 10th, he rose in the Senate to propose a post-war security treaty among the victorious allies to ensure that Germany would never again wage war on its neighbors. Boom. This was the Senate's leading isolationist calling for an American commitment to an entangling alliance with countries that had fought two world wars in the last three decades. It was, one correspondent said, the speech heard around the world. It was a renunciation of beliefs he had espoused for 25 years. When asked about Vandenberg's speech, FDR spoke dismissively, but the White House made a hasty request for 50 copies before the president <laughs> departed for Yalta. Within months, the world and Vandenberg's place in it had changed quickly. Roosevelt returned from Yalta, realizing that he had no choice if he was to avoid Woodrow Wilson's fatal mistake with the League of Nations after World War I, other than to appoint Vandenberg, the leading Republican voice on foreign policy and the ranking Republican on the Foreign Relations Committee, as a delegate to the conference to be convened in May 1945 in San Francisco to create the United Nations. These are the first UN, there was, there was a six-person delegation. Uh, Vandenberg and his Senate counterpart, Tom Connolly of Texas, a Democrat who chaired the Foreign Relations Committee, their counterparts in the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and then a, a young naval commander, uh, formerly the Boy Wonder Governor of Minnesota, Harold Stassen, and then the president of Barnard College, a woman named Virginia Gildersleeve. That was with the American delegates to the meeting in San Francisco to create the UN. And this here they're meeting with Franklin Roosevelt days before Franklin Roosevelt died in April of 1945. Vice President Harry Truman had had lunch once with the president between the election and Roosevelt's death. He was a neophyte in foreign affairs, although a decisive one, because he quickly announced that the UN meeting that was scheduled for a month later in San Francisco would move ahead. And since Roosevelt had often worked around the State Department in crafting foreign policy, his new young Secretary of State, Edward Stettinius, was a marginal player. Vandenberg's Democratic counterpart, Foreign Relations Chairman Connolly, was a canny old politician, but of, of limited range. And that left Vandenberg, the Republican who had come around to speak out first in favor of such an organization, to emerge as the most influential American delegate. This is the penthouse of the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco, where the American delegation stayed, and in Statinius's suite, the penthouse, um, where they sat down with the other major powers for what would become the Security Council to design what Vandenberg liked to call the town meeting of the world. And it was there that his opinion and that of the Soviet Foreign Secretary Molotov seemed to be the ones that counted most. And the in San Francisco, with, with Vandenberg um, 
Faber brought along as his own personal advisor, John Foster Dulles, who would later become Secretary of State under Eisenhower and was the one of the foreign policy gurus of the Republican Party. And was also helped by Nelson Rockefeller, the young assistant secretary of state for Latin America. Uh, when that meeting convened in San Francisco, there were so many countries that had either been aligned with the, with, with the Axis powers of Germany and Italy and Japan and others, or um, were still colonies of Britain or other countries that the largest single block of delegates were the Latin Americans. And so it was important for the US if we wanted to have our ideas carry the day, whether it's on the UN, on the veto or qualifications for membership or whatever it might be at the UN, to have the votes of those Latin Americans on our side. And Nelson Rockefeller could deliver those. So, um, that he made sure, Vandenberg and Rockefeller made sure that the UN Charter allowed for regional security arrangements within the Charter. So that with, under, growing out of the Monroe Doctrine, the US and its Latin American neighbors could have a mutual defense treaty, for example. And he made, and Vandenberg made sure there would be enough Republicans on board in the Senate to approve the Charter when it landed in their laps. And here we are signing the cha charter in August of 1945 with uh, President Truman had gone up to San Francisco to be a part of that event. When the charter was ratified, the president asked Vandenberg and Connolly to play an unprecedented role in diplomacy. For starters, in the fall of 1945, they were appointed to the American delegation to the first UN General Assembly in London. Now this is before we had a UN ambassador, so these were the American delegates. And on the far right is Connolly and Secretary of State Statinius and then Vandenberg, and you may recognize Eleanor Roosevelt. That was the American delegation. Uh, and it's, it, it's, I love how these things work out sometimes. Vandenberg and Eleanor had a rather bitter relationship. Vandenberg and other Republicans regarded Eleanor as the, this leftist voice in Franklin's ear, always pushing him further to the left. And Eleanor really resented Vandenberg's rather effective uh, attacks on the New Deal. And so there was no love lost at all as they embark on this trip. But by the time they had sailed from New York to Southampton, the first uh, General Assembly meeting was in London, uh, Roosevelt, or excuse me, Vandenberg writes to John Foster Dulles and says, I take back everything I've said about her, and it's been plenty. <laughs> and, and Eleanor, at the end of their stay in London, writes to Arthur Vandenberg and practically pleads with him to stay on as a member of the delegation. And he said, well, thank you, you know, but I've got to get back to the Senate. You know, I've got a, a day job here. And, but they ended up being sort of mutual admirers, which I think is a, a hopeful thing for the Republic. Um, more significantly, Vandenberg and Connolly joined the, new, the next Secretary of State, James Burns, for conferences with foreign ministers in Paris through much of 1946 to negotiate peace treaties with countries such as Italy that had fought on the German side. And so here you had two American senators who, and in fact Vandenberg returned to Grand Rapids, he was, he was running for re-election in the fall of 46, the day before the election. He had not delivered a single campaign speech, had not been, been in Grand Rapids since uh, for six months before the election. Uh, but I don't think before or since, to my knowledge, have we ever had senators or congressmen play such a key role in international negotiations that they're actually sitting at these peace conferences participating. And here, this is actually in the, the Luxembourg Palace where these negotiations were taking place in Paris. And there's a round table in the background where the delegates went, met, and uh, Vandenberg looks a little like the cat who swallowed the canary just sort of <laughs> presiding over this. Uh, 1946 was also the year that Look Magazine published a profile of him. In, this, in, in that story, there's a couple of paragraphs that I, I can't resist sharing that get at aspects of his influence. Uh, Every few months, wrote Look, several million people become grateful to Vandenberg for expressing their vague thoughts, such as, what is Russia up to? 
and in he was a master politician in his ability to be flexible and principled at the same time. Um, in fall, in the fall of '45, he actually delivers a speech called "Raise the Iron Curtain." He's very proud of it. He had it pub, you know, sta published, sent out on stationery with the title of the speech there, and. Winston Churchill had used that phrase, Iron Curtain, in a speech to Parliament, and once in correspondence with the new president, Harry Truman. But Vandenberg was quite proud of himself because he was the first one to use that phrase in public in North America. And the, he sends this letter out, he sends, one, he sends it to his friend John Foster Dulles, and Dulles writes back to him and says, Great speech. No, too bad nobody heard it. It came in the news cycle <laughs> at the same time that, I, if I'm not mistaken, Eisenhower returned triumphantly from Europe, where he'd been, of course, the victorious general uh, as the war ended, and there were, and, and Truman had issued an important statement about atomic energy and the and the atomic bomb, and so nobody paid any attention to Vandenberg's speech. As so, Della says, in great speech. Too many nobody. Too bad nobody heard it, but I'm sure the phrasing will catch on. Which, of course, it did six months later in Fulton, Missouri, when Winston Churchill talked about raising the Iron Curtain uh, in a speech there. But Vandenberg was the master politician in his ability to be flexible and principled at the same time. And he had the credibility that went with a reformed sinner. He knew what it was like to be an isolationist and fight American engagement in the world. In fact, he'd always wanted to write a biography of St. Paul, although his con conversion was a little more drawn out. Um, <laughs> here he is back in Grand Rapids on election eve in 1946, where he was re-elected, and he becomes something of an oracle. As Luke said, it might take a whirling dervish to follow the pros and cons of Vandenberg's Senate votes over the past 18 years, <laughs> but Vandenberg has whirled as the American people have whirled, or as one of his fellow senators put it, Van changes his mind about as often as the average American, but slightly earlier. And I think there's a, sort of an understated hint of genius in that slightly earlier. That means you're not far out and so far out in front that you're a leader without followers, and, and he was no visionary, but he could express and shape the temper of the times. Or as Emerson said in his essay, Self-Reliance, and Vandenberg was a fan of Emerson, Speak what you now think in hard words, and tomorrow speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words again, though it contradict everything you say today. He was ready to change and willing when the time was right. And that's what Vandenberg was doing, <coughs> in bringing millions of anxious Americans who had shared his isolationist impulse before the war along with him. That made a big difference when President Truman asked for support of the Truman Doctrine, and here he is before a joint session of Congress doing that calling for the U.S. to help nations threatened by communist subversion. More specifically, he was supporting Truman when the president asked Americans to pick up the baton from the impoverished British and aid the governments of Greece and Turkey against Soviet pressure. He also, in 1946, the Republicans recaptured the majority in the Senate, and Vandenberg not only became chairman of the, of the Foreign Relations Committee, he also became president pro tem of the Senate. <coughs> And in his long hours in the Senate, often presiding, he would pass the time doing these elaborate doodles. And the, uh, he would just leave these lying around. Uh, some he saved, some, other some others saved. In fact, uh, Fred Wright and I were talking uh, earlier about um, the daughter of a friend of ours who's an archivist at the LBJ Library. And my, our, our mutual friend had, um, when I was talking about these doodles, uh, said, showed me one that his daughter had found that had been hanging in LBJ's office when he was in the Senate, and nobody really knew where it had come from. And all I can think of is that LBJ was in, still in the House when Vandenberg was in the Senate, but probably after a joint session, LBJ may have found it lying around and picked it up and framed it for his office. But the, um, that consensus that Vandenberg can build also made all the difference when Secretary of State George Marshall proposed an unprecedented aid program to help the European democracies rebuild their shattered economies. And here's Vandenberg and Marshall, who were meeting weekly at the Blair House down the street from the White House to 
plan how to present the Marshall Plan, make it saleable to Congress. Truman had the political sense to call this the Marshall Plan after the revered general. Marshall himself said it could have been called the Vandenberg Plan because, as he reflected, when it went to Congress, Van was just the whole show. And he was the center of attention at the Republican Convention in 1948 as well, when it looked like whoever ran would be Harry Truman. Here he is with his wife Hazel in Rittenhouse Square in Philadelphia, uh, surrounded by the, the press and the paparazzi. He did not campaign, however, and Thomas Dewey became the nominee. Meanwhile, Americans were learning that rebuilding European economies was not enough. There was also the power vacuum left by the war and now being filled in Eastern Europe by the Soviet Red Army. The war-wrecked Western democracies formed a European Union for mutual defense and invited the Americans to join. And this was a big one, an entangling alliance in peacetime, which Vandenberg had always so adamantly resisted. The Vandenberg Resolution, one page which he typed out himself on that typewriter we saw before in his apartment on Connecticut Avenue, enabled American entry into the new North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It sailed through Congress with Vandenberg's leadership. These bipartisan majorities were his pride and joy, and here he is at a Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearing with Marshall's successor as Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, far to the right. But those bipartisan majorities began to fray about the time that Vandenberg was diagnosed in 1949 with lung cancer. After fighting fellow Republicans in the House to secure funding for NATO military aid, he was flown to Ann Arbor for an operation that removed half of his left lung. As Mao and the Communists emerged victorious in China, Vandenberg headed back to his home in Grand Rapids to the house he had built as a young editor in 1907. As he lay dying, Vandenberg cherished the chatty notes he received from General Marshall, who reminisced about the days when Marshall's undersecretary, Robert Lovett, came by the Vandenberg apartment to flesh out NATO and other significant initiatives. It would have been a great relaxer to sit down and have a drink with you and Bob Lovett and decide just how we were going to manage the world and then have done it, Marshall wrote. And Vandenberg replied, those were truly great days. Looking backward, it is really quite amazing how well we and the world got along together. But times were already changing. Not only had bipartisanship suffered amid recrimination over who lost China, as the Civil War there drew to an end, and, the, and Mao, Mao and the Communists took power, but a young Republican senator from Wisconsin named McCarthy was fomenting fear with wild accusations of Communists in the Truman administration and war had broken out in Korea. The bipartisan bonds were coming apart and Vandenberg was not there to patch them up. And that brings us back full circle. When Vandenberg died in April 1951, his slide into relative obscurity began. News of his death was overshadowed by General Douglas MacArthur's address to a joint session of Congress. The general, so recently relieved of his command by President Truman, ended his speech with a line about how old soldiers never die, they just fade away. But the eulogies began to pour in. With bipartisanship giving way to the McCarthy era and increasing polarization, journalist Edward R. Murrow paid tribute to Vandenberg for his CB, uh, to his CBS radio audience with words that I'll close with today. We are now divided, bitterly, hysterically, Murrow observed, noting of Arthur Vandenberg, had he lived, he would have gloried in this conflict and steadied it. And he would have been confident that at the end of the day, little men of loud voice and small faith will yield to the collective judgment of the American people. Thank you very much. And I'd love to spend a few minutes talking about this and thinking about any questions you have. I, I was thinking on my way over about Vandenberg and Hoover's relationship, which um, coming early in Vandenberg's career, I don't spend a lot of time with, but not only was Vandenberg trying to work with Hoover, negotiating between the old guard and the progressives, and then between Hoover and Bora on things like farm bills, um, but also um, Hoover was trying to get European uh, debt relief restructured. And uh, Vandenberg, as a, as a freshman senator, um, 
talked about how he was on a, he was on a cruise with the Detroit Chamber of Commerce on Lake Erie. They were cruising up to Toronto and back. And he was when he got to Toronto, he was summoned to a payphone to take a call from President Hoover, who was trying to line up support to restructure German war debts in, in, the, in those critical early years of the Depression. Um, and he thought, you know, probably the only time that a, that a president has ever called a senator on a payphone in another country. <laughs> uh, and then you know, he was trying to work with Hoover on the Smoot-Hawley tariff. And there's a lot of people in this room who know a lot more about that than I do, except um, the you know, Vandiver wanted Hoover to have more flexibility in not letting the Senate just run wild, setting or the Congress run wild, setting whatever tariff rates on whatever products they wanted. Uh, and he was unsuccessful in, in helping Hoover with that, and so then joined in with his fellow legislators in looking after their own and uh, getting a restriction on. Uh, one of my favorites is he 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 had a an. Um, there was a company in Grand Rapids that made flypaper, and he had a tariff imposed on imported flypaper to protect the domestic industry. So it, it went, you know, that, that's not like the great work of, of senators that he set out to be. And then there was one of them that, that left Hoover rather bitter. Um, Vandenberg, I guess any senator could be said to be the deciding vote, but it, you know, as we've seen in recent days, you know, there are certain senators who say, well, this one, he or she is the deciding vote. Vandenberg played that role when, in an earlier very contentious uh, Supreme Court nomination of a Judge Parker of North Carolina, who, as, as I think Hoover, and again, there are people in this room who know a lot more about this than I do, but I have the impression that Hoover, trying to build a coalition, coalition with conservative Southern Democrats, names a very conservative judge from North Carolina and nominates him for the Supreme Court. And this judge had uh, rather racist views and had also been responsible for some um, anti-union uh, um, judgments and both labor and the NAACP were lobbying heavily against Judge Parker's appointment to the court and Vandenberg who tried so hard to support Hoover in so many ways um, but whose grandfather had been um, an abolitionist and a delegate, a Lincoln delegate to the 1860 Republican Convention, uh, just couldn't abide this uh, senator's uh, racial views and segregationist views, and so cast the deciding vote, and it was a one-vote decision to um, defeat the appointment of Judge Parker. But anyway, I, I could read a lot, but I'd love to just talk about any thoughts you have time. Yeah, two questions. Um, the you briefly alluded to British intelligence kind of being involved in trying to isolate the isolationists in 1940 uh, and kind of Mizzy Sims, uh, but also the Hoover folks always thought that British intelligence was behind the uh, uh, cutting out the audio at the National Convention so that no one in the the audience heard Hoover, but over the radio, the national audience heard Hoover, but no applause. And uh, again, this this idea that they didn't want an isolationist nominated by the Republican Party; they wanted an internationalist. And what, was that 19, the nineteen forty convention when Hoover was addressing the convention? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, and it's kind of like you know the Nixon Kennedy debates. Those who heard it on the radio um, thought Nixon won. Those who watched it on TV saw Nixon sweating and kind of the dark circles under the eye, and we're certain that Kennedy won. I mean, you know, per perception is yeah. Well, and, and, and of course, in 1940, you had you had Wilkie's team who were very effectively packing the galleries with the "We Want Wilkie" chants. Right, and, right. You know, and so I was thinking that probably that they that you know Governor Baldwin of Connecticut and some of the folks prior working with working with Wilkie may have been responsible, but that's fascinating to think about. I mean, so then certainly, if you were, if you were the British, and it increasingly looked, I mean, it, it, it was no secret that your, your fate hung on whether the United States was going to come to your rescue or not, and here you've got um, the, the, one of the two major parties 
is viewed as the chief obstacle to your, your survival, perhaps, there must have been all kinds of ways. I, 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 Vandenberg, who's, Vandenberg's relationship was, uh, Mitzi Sims was the wife of Harold Sims, who was a Canadian. She was, she was born in Denmark, but her, her husband, much older husband, was a Canadian diplomat attached, just called an attache to the British Embassy. And um, almost viewed as, as almost a kind of a, kind of a, a wealthy diplomatic appointment coming from a wealthy family in Montreal, and um, nobody really knew what his job was. But the rumors were that he ran the code room at the embassy. And then uh, I, I was interviewing an elderly um, Chicago Tribune correspondent, Washington correspondent, long retired. Who's, who just said in the most matter-of-fact way, well, of course the British planted Mitzi on Vandenberg just like they planted K. Summers beyond Ike. It just, you know, just, just totally matter-of-fact. And so you knew that that would, and, and I talked to a, 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 a fellow who'd been, a, who'd been high up in, in Army intelligence with, with Eisenhower, and, and he said, you know, kind of what we were all assigned these attractive young female drivers. And so you just, <laughs> the, the, it just, it was almost a given that you had to be on the alert. And, and this correspondent went to a, a in, in the, in 19, I think it was in 39, at the time of the, de, the early debate over the repeal of the arms embargo that would have enabled us to sell arms to Britain. Um, there was a meeting in Vandenberg's apartment uh, with Vandenberg and a couple of the other Republican isolationists, and I think Bert Wheeler, who was the Democrat who said so famously that we're, you know, that Roosevelt will plow up every other American boy or something like that. Um, and Mitzi, Mit, the, Mit, the, the Simses were upstairs neighbors of the Vandenbergs at the Wardman apartment towers in Washington. So they were doing things socially together, Harold and Harold and Mitzi and Arthur and Hazel, and, but Hazel um, had severe, um, not asthma, but, but um, words going to elude me a moment, but she was, she was in Arizona in the dry desert air, uh, and Mitzi was hanging around Arthur's depart apartment when, uh, much to the uh, distaste of this correspondent who clearly thought that she was there with ulterior motives, and um, certainly he was, a he was a friend of Hazel's and didn't like what he was picking up there. But, but the Vandenberg's daughter said that it was, it was more than just a fling, that, that Arthur Vandenberg, that Arthur, her dad, had to decide whether to stay or go, and, and, and as did Hazel. And um, a friend of Hazel's talked about, um, you know, the, the, the the light sort of went out in their relationship after that. They were they were uh, close politically, but but that relationship with Mitzi changed everything else. The yeah. the second question, if you could talk a little bit more about that um, bipartisan coalition, I know that as long as FDR lived, he wouldn't have anything to do with Hoover. But the moment he dies, Truman comes in. Truman reaches out because throughout. The New Deal. I mean, his brain trust was saying, you know, Hoover's the guy we should bring in on this because, and of course, Hoover had the most extensive um, food relief yeah. uh, experience of, of, of any American. Plus, he was the one guy that the Germans trusted uh, of all the Americans because he's the one who fed him after World War One. So, um, wonder if you could talk a little bit more about um, kind of others in that bipartisan coalition, and did Vandenberg have any doubts, I mean, about being too cozy, <laughs> uh, you know, with, uh, with Truman and with Roosevelt, uh, especially maybe on domestic issues? I think he knew he had to walk a fine line because he, he, he would lose his credibility with the Republican caucus. He, 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 you know, the, uh, people ask about, about some present-day similarities and, and you know, John McCain coming to mind as someone who was sort of independent in his thinking, but McCain, for whatever his his great virtues, was sort of a pure maverick. Where Vandenberg's value lay in that he could bring significant Republican votes with him, and and was a respected leader in that way. But um, 
the the and, and, and Vandenberg remained. I think. I mean, even though Hoover resented Vandenberg's desertion on Judge Parker, they remained on good terms. And so, um, what the um, I think one of the one of the one of the great moments of when the coalition it, for goes begin the bipartisan stuff starts in a sense in Vandenberg working with Democrats to thwart some of the New Deal. And so, and of course, one of the most famous instances is the is court packing, where where Vandenberg where where Hoover as the respected elder statesman of the Republican Party wants to and, and feeling very passionate that Roosevelt ought not to be tampering with the Supreme Court wants to give a major address and Vandenberg has to go to him and say please don't because if we hang back the Democrats will take the lead and we'll join them but if we make it too much of a Republican issue that's going to put the pressure on the Democrats to, to support their president and, and Vandenberg talks about how painful it was for him to to have to 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 think of saying to their last president, please, you know, be quiet. That's that was that was not something that he wanted to do. But that that was the beginning of some significant bipartisan outreach. Where um, the and this is in the in the Senate um, from. The late 30s on, I think there was a tacit understanding that, that Vandenberg generally took the lead in foreign policy and Taft in domestic policy. So, um, the and, and the and so and, and even though Vandenberg may have been, he was somewhat less conservative than Taft. Uh, he was also going to defer to Taft on a lot of domestic legislation, and and he's. He was working. He was corresponding a little bit with a senator named Josiah Bailey, a North Carolina Democrat, in the in the late 30s, in the wake of the court packing. Even as Roosevelt is talking about a new liberal party realigning with Roosevelt and Wilkie, they're talking about maybe there's a, a fusion there. But the Democrats really in this. But this is with Southern Democrats for whom the notion of allying yourself with Republicans is still really distasteful. And so you could never really get those Democrats to, to move into a, to any kind of, it would never go beyond that, that, um, that kind of temporary coalition. They didn't want to be identified with, with Democrats otherwise. But, but you're right, I mean, who certainly, Hoover recognized, or Truman recognized Hoover's talents. And so it comes time to reorganize the government. And who do you call? Or you call the man who knows so much about governmental organization, a lot more than most senators know. And he was not, and in fact, um, and so I think his willingness to, to invite Hoover in and, and, and benefit from Hoover's expertise was maybe a little bit like, um, I had the, one of the people I had the pleasure of interviewing was uh, Clark Clifford, Hoover's, excuse me, Truman's long, long time aide uh, later Secretary of Defense, but uh, under with with Johnson, but um, and it was trivia, but it was the week before Clark Clifford was indicted in a banking scandal when he's like 90 years old. I don't know if some of you remember that, and I don't think I could have gotten to him after that. But 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 he said, but Clifford said of Truman, part of his genius lay in not have, let, letting his ego get in the way, in, in letting people like Vandenberg and Atchison, who had big egos, sort it out and just sort of stand back and let, let them do it. And, um, or, you know, name the Marshall Plan after Marshall, not Truman, because that's going to sell more and I don't need my name on it. And, um, and I bet that that same approach allowed him to, to invite Hoover in, in a way that Roosevelt just couldn't abide that kind of relationship with any of these significant figures. Thank you. Yes, sir. Did uh, Senator Vandenberg Did uh, Senator Vandenberg have any presidential ambitions? Uh, perennially, but he had more. <laughs> he, he, I mean, but he 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 didn't want to work that hard. It was part of it. Um, you know, he, 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 was, he had enough of an ego that he always hoped that he might get drafted. And he was used to conventions where he might be everybody's second choice. And if there's a, if there's a deadlock, they'll turn to me. 
because he'd rather do that than I don't want to tramp around New Hampshire in February. I mean, there was just that. He, he basically he said something that's not an exact quote, but it's not too far off. And so in 1940, uh, he, when he was a leading Dark Horse contender, and of course, Wilkie came in so much at the last minute that he wasn't even a part of, you know, that was in the early days of presidential primaries, but Vandenberg let his name be entered in Wisconsin and Nebraska, that, and then had his Senate colleagues in those states uh, uh, campaign on his behalf, but I don't even think he gave a speech in either of those two states.